better. Good morning and welcome to ECLAS 22. It's been three years since ECLAS community gathered in one place in Oslo and after last year's conference, completely online conference in, uh, organized by our colleagues from Sweden, uh, this is the first hybrid event. I'm happy to see so many familiar and new faces and I would also like to welcome all the participants online who are uh, able to see us but we are not able to see them. Um, uh, I won't be too long because we are already late, of course, and I would only like to invite to the floor three ladies who will welcome you. First, the Dean of Biotechnical Faculty, Professor Natasha Poklar-Ulrich, then our head of our department, Department of Landscape Architecture, Professor Anna Kuchan, and last but not least, ECLAS President Ellen Fetzer. So the floor is yours. Hello to everybody and welcome to Ljubljana, to Biotechnical Faculty and uh, dear Head of Landscape Architecture, Professor uh, Anna Kuchan, dear guests and all participants of the annual conference of the European Council of La Landscape Architecture. We are very pleased that the conference is in Ljubljana at our faculty and organized by Department of Landscape Architecture. And this year is very special for us at Biotechnical Faculty since we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of, the, uh, of Biotechnical Faculty and the Landscape Architecture Department celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Landscape Architecture Program. The Department of Landscape Architecture is the smallest department in biotechnical faculty, but the largest in terms of number of international and national awards for faculty members and students. Some of the students' award-winning projects are on display in the outer, uh, other building, where is the seat of uh, Department of Landscape Architecture. And I must say that we are all at biotechnical faculty very proud on uh, our, the smallest department, but as I mentioned, the greatest. <laughs> uh, and I'm uh, really happy that I can welcome you all here from all over the world. And we are very hon honored that among us are three um, prominent keynote speakers. Professor uh, Luchka Kaifesh Bogatai, who is a well established and recognized Slovenian climatologist, a specialist in agricultural meteorology, and member of intergovernmental panel of, on climate change in Geneva, Professor Karl uh, Steinitz. Professor of Landscape Architecture and Planning at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design since 1973. And in 2007, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Ljubljana. Welcome. And uh, Professor Martin Prominski, Professor and Chair of Urban and Landscape Design at Leibniz University, and of course the President of um, Society. And uh, welcome again, and have a very successful conference. Thank you. Dear Dean, thank you for your um, kind words. Ellen, welcome. Uh, the president of ECLAS, our respected keynote speakers, and all attendees in the hall and behind the screens. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the ECLAS 2022 in Ljubljana. I believe many of you are glad to be able to revisit. Uh, and some are here for the first time, equally excited. We are glad to have you here and hope the conference will meet your expectations. 
This is the time to celebrate, and there are many reasons for it. With this conference, ECLAS continues its mission to help us cope with ever more uncertain future. But it also offers the grounds for a retrospective. The Department of Landscape Architecture celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Landscape Architecture Program at the University of Ljubljana. The program was established by late Professor Dusan Ogrin, whom many of you have met and who, with his wit, high standards, and social talents, has succeeded in weaving ties that can't be broken. It has also been 50 years since Ogrin has organized one of the first conferences on landscape planning, which Karl, now an honorary doctor of the University of Ljubljana, has attended and has been coming to Ljubljana ever since. We are also celebrating 30 years of the Slovenian Association of Landscape Architects, paying respect to the efforts of colleagues who exercise and defend the legacy of the school in everyday practice, fighting continuously to show the public what the profession has to offer and who endure despite ever more adverse circumstances. The theme of ECLAS 22 is devoted to the question of scale, the one question that does not have any, an immediate or a definite answer. It's constantly hovering above our heads since it addresses the very identity of the profession and the nature of the context in which we operate and teach. After optimistic early years that shaped our profession, we now act in a claustrophobic reality. Despite we are courageously meeting the challenges and are looking forward to exchanging our knowledge and idea. I wish you all a satisfactory stay. Thank you. Dear, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's great to see you back both here on site in Ljubljana and online connected to this wonderful conference. Scales of change are also scales of time. We heard a lot of numbers, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. I just want to remember one number, which is 20 years. 20 years ago, we met in Budapest, and that was the beginning of the cycles of Le Notre, the Le Notre projects, which were greatly enhancing what ECAS is doing. And the school here in Ljubljana has been actively involved uh, all the time, already actually in the establishing of ECLAS as an organization. So we saw um, the evolution of JOLA, the tuning process to align education, the establishment of the Notre Institute as a promoter of sustainable landscape development. So uh, Ljubljana has been a critical friend all the time and helped us to evolve. Um, ha happy birthday, I would like to say to, <laughs> to the faculty. Um, and I just hope that you stay on to be a critical friend of ECLAS to help us evolve and have a really a high level quality discourse on what landscape architecture has, uh, to, has to do in Europe. So, and I wish everyone um, that now that we are back here, both online but also here on site, that you have fruitful, creative dialogues uh, with your peers here, that you help uh, to build relationships, because this is what ECLAS is all about. It's about having good partnerships and um, friendships between people that make it relevant for the community to evolve in very difficult times that we have. Thank you, and let's start. <laughs> Um, hello, I thank uh, all three for these inspiring and short welcome addresses. Uh, uh, my name is Moetza Golovic. Uh, in the name of organizing a committee of this conference, I'd like to thank all the colleagues who helped. I have a very, very good and uh, supportive team. Uh, and I'll be moderating this first plenary session. We have, as already mentioned, two speakers. <coughs> And the first one is our <laughs> colleague, Luchka, Professor Luchka Kaifesh Bugatai. Uh, you heard she's a climatologist and she's been a member of IPCC for more than 20 years in various roles. And she was also a member uh, at the time uh, when IPCC got a Nobel Prize. So Luchka is a very famous person, uh, but not only 
this. She's also our, our dear colleague. She taught many generations of landscape architects. Uh, even at times when climate and climate change was not yet the topic, but we also uh, already considered it is important to understand this relation between climate system and um, land use or cultural and agricultural landscapes. So we start with global scale, and I hope not in too pessimistic way. <laughs> so, uh, Luchka, I invite you. Uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Since it's still morning, uh, first of all, I would like to thank organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's really an honor to speak uh, before so many professors. So usually students are sitting here, but now I guess uh, we are colleagues. Uh, well, uh, when I was thinking about this keynote, um, I thought at first I will focus on climate change. But uh, I did change a bit uh, of the presentation because I think that uh, things are very much more complex uh, uh, that just, uh, if you only had only climate change as a problem, maybe that would not be, uh, we will not be in a situation that we are. So I, 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 that's a subtitle. Uh, Earth limited capacity to support consumption patterns of modern humanity. So it's a short abstract, actually, this subtitle. Okay, let me say, I'll start with the cliche that uh, good planets are hard to find. Actually, when I was a, uh, a child, uh, we landed on moon, and at that time we expected that it's just a matter of years when we will conquer Mars or even go beyond Mars. But this is the planet we were born on, and this is the planet we will die on. But uh, uh, it's a beautiful planet with one huge mistake. Uh, it does not grow. It does not grow. And that's why it's under the pressure. And uh, here is a list, a very short list of the problems we are having. It's not just about climate change, as I told you. It's also connected to our economic model, because economic model of growth um, is maybe the key problem why we're having uh, increased use of natural resources. And uh, ecosystem loss is something that we are not observing in Europe. But if we go to Asia or other continents, we can see that almost half of the nature is lost forever in terms of our generation. Uh, yes, we have problems with inequality, which is much bigger problem than uh, increase of population. It's not about how many we are. It's about how minor minority lives. And science is not uh, so powerful, so there are always some surprises waiting for us. If you remember Fukushima, half an hour, a very strong country, got problems which is still having. COVID probably was a surprise. Okay, Ukraine war is not a surprise totally, but yes, we act like it was a surprise. Yeah, it's, it's, all this is connected. And uh, if we want to find, uh, I'm, I studied physics, a common denominator for all this, Maybe it's the best illustrated in this graph. So why are we having so many problems? In, I'm talking now about more environment, not just social problems. It's uh, about our lifestyle, which has changed in a matter of two generations. We are modern persons needing one gigajoule per day in average. All of us sitting here, we use more than one gigajoule. This is average, so Africa and all the poor people included. What has changed so dramatically? The upper part of this column is our mobility. We are totally obsessed by mobility. We saw at COVID that we can survive without mobility, but one year after the situation, the world is traveling uh, more than ever. We are also obsessed by shopping. This shopping, in broad terms, consumption, um, if we compare that to our grandfathers, the energy used for that, I guess, 
that this part of energy is what we actually need. But we today also buy things we want to have. And we have young generation who unfortunately cannot distinguish between what I need and I want to have. Anyway, our housing, we have bigger flats, we have warmer flats, we have two flats, etc. And even our stomachs, we did not change from Roman times. We use twice as much energy for feeding us because we throw food away and we eat much more meat, in short. So when we are asking what went wrong, it's not about that we are seven billions now. Yes, it is a, or eight billions, sorry. It's also how we as a person live. This different lifestyle, which is growing, but the planet does not grow. But it's not just about energy. We can see the proportions or, or what energy are we using very connected to climate change, this graph, but also to other ecological problems. So we are still depending on coal, even more because of the Russian crisis, on oil and gas. So black, yellow, and red, it's about 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Yes, there is some also renewables and things like nuclear energy, but it's not just the proportions, it's also the, the shape of this graph. We all know what exponential curve is, and this is exponential on the planet which does not grow. And uh, don't think that I'm obsessed by energy. We can also look at other things. We can look at dams, transportation, our mobile phones, tourism, paper production. So everything is growing. And uh, it's very uh, obvious that this growth began after the Second World War with the processes of globalization and with the adoption of economic model of growth. This is not a coincidence. So yes, planet does not grow. And that's why uh, we had to think about what, how, how much of our um, uh, of our ambitious actions, this planet can survive. So I really like the planetary boundary concept developed by uh, Stockholm University. It's been around for about, uh, I guess, now more than 15 years, or about 15 years, when actually science decided to tell policymakers and to tell decision makers how far can we go. We have to put some limits on our action, and it's about how Earth's capacity can tolerate changes. So we are talking about changes, even in title. And if we surpass some of these changes, we are really risking stability of the planet, not just the future generation. It's about physics of the planet, because it cannot withstand, probably, the pressures uh, we are putting as a one uh, biological species. So the first step of this concept was to achieve the consensus, what are the problems? Because if you don't see the problems, then how will you get the solution? So this is the list of the most prominent uh, problems we have to deal with today or yesterday, maybe. Yes, of course, it's climate change is there, but it's not alone. We have problems of biodiversity loss, we have problems with land system change, with chemical pollution, with water, etc. Maybe some problems are not so close to you, like ocean acidification, but it's an evil twin of climate change, because CO2 is not just entering the atmosphere, it also enters the water, and water becomes acid. Atmospheric aerosol loading sounds very scientific, but it's air pollution. And ozone hole, we all know that this problem is not so... Uh, so actual today, because there were some uh, some actions taken, but still, we are not uh, reaching the same situation. So uh, what science did is to put numbers, to show policymakers, to show decision makers, this is it, this is the top. I will not bother you with these numbers, just to believe me, they are there. In case of climate change, it's a very simple indicator. It's how much a concentration of CO2 in the air is. It's a, the safe limit is beyond 350 ppm. Biodiversity loss, it's normal that some species disappear in time. 
but it's not normal that it disappears more than one species per million per year. Right now, the rate of extinction is 1,000 times higher because of the humans. This is no doubt. Land system change. We cannot use all the land for agriculture, for instance. The safe limit is 12%. If we use more, we take space from forests for other uh, creatures to live on. So yes, there are limits. Not This was made in 2015. In 2015, uh, they were not really sure what are the limits for chemical pollution. And also, it was not clear uh, how do we stand with aerosol loading limit. 2015, this year. OK, just I will show you uh, what situation in 2015 was. So this is our planet that does not grow. And we should go back to history to Napoleon time, Napoleon and our great uh, poet Presheran lived at that time. One billion people, or maybe less. What was the pressure of those people to the planet? Be careful, look at the center. I will repeat, very small. Practically at that time, yes, the nature was free supermarket. But after the Second World War, things began to change. We had to rebuild the society. We start using uh, oil, for instance. We had to feed people. And of course, Haber and Bosch provided artificial uh, fertilizers, which fed the world. Uh, in the 70s, we managed to cross the first safe line. It was about nitrogen and phosphorus. so. It was about fertilizing and about eutrophication. Because uh, nitrogen did not go into the plant. It was planned. Yes, it goes into the plant. But maybe you don't know how much. 14%. All the rest goes into environment, into water, and at the seas with the dead zones. Uh, at that time, people really began to worry about environment for the first time in the li their lives. So ministries for the environment appeared. Before the 70s, there was not such thing. Non-governmental organization became powerful from, uh, because today they are normal phenomena, but not then. In the 80s, we managed to cross the safe uh, border with climate change, make the situation even worse with nitrogen. And in the last uh, 30 or maybe less years, I'm talking about 2015. We made all the problems worse and also crossed biodiversity by far. Uh, and it was not clear what's going on with chemical pollution in 2015 and with aerosol load. And all this is connected. That's why I'm not talking just about climate change. For instance, just a short example, biofuels. You remember biofuels. Biofuels were invented to push this down in European politics. But to produce biofuel, you need land. You need to fertilize the land. You destroy biodiversity, and you use some water. So to handle one problem in the way that you create three others, this is not what I call a holistic solution. But uh, uh, Moetza said, not be too pessimistic. <laughs> I'm sorry, Moetza. In January this year, it was clearly established that the next uh, safe boundary was crossed. It was about environmental pollutants, including plastics. At least 200 substances are already spread over the world industrial chemicals that are uh, simply beyond uh, safe level. And uh, it did not end in January. It continued in April, when actually uh, water limit uh, regarding the green water was also already transgressed. So that's why we cannot see one problem in isolation. We have to look at the whole picture, which is not very uh, nice. But the world is different. We cannot, we don't have the same lifestyle. 
I mentioned that in Europe we use much more than one gigajoule energy per day. So in terms of biophysical boundaries, I was just explaining, we can see that in Africa, in some countries, they don't transgress practically no limit. But if you look at the European situation or North Americas, actually all boundaries are transgressed. So we are doing much worse. Okay, India, maybe some parts of Indonesia, they are still on the... Uh, okay, this research is done by University of Leeds, by the way. And uh, that puzzled me. How are we doing? How is Slovenia doing? Uh, yes, you can find on this uh, website called A Good Life for All Within Planetary Boundaries. I chose two European countries. Probably you know why. <laughs> if you ask young people, where would you like to live? Uh, what do you think they will choose? Uh, anyway, in Germany, you look at these boundaries that are transgressed. Uh, they are doing still fine with land use and with water, but not all water, blue water. All the other boundaries are crossed. In Albania, we all know that lifestyle is much different there. Uh, they also have problems with nitrogen because they, the food production is all already there but uh, much less problems. They are not even exceeding CO2 level regarding greenhouse emissions if we talk about sustainable levels. Uh, so I promise to talk about Slovenia. On this university webpage, you also see trend in time because the world was not born yesterday and problems in the environment also not yesterday. In Slovenia, 1992, we already transgressed the safe boundary, it's not very clear here, regarding climate change, regarding uh, nitrogen, uh, and uh, I think uh, this is also about material use. It's a bit different categories, but it's consumption anyway. But we were on the safe side uh, with water and many other. But then we entered the different economic model. We joined the European Union. Our lifestyle is exactly, oh, exactly, almost exactly the same like in Austria or even maybe in some Nordic countries. Yes, in 2000, we start to expand our economy. In 2010, uh, further, and the last data is 2015. Uh, we are still doing well with water, but not because we manage water so well, but because God gave us the country that has uh, sources of water everywhere, um, except this summer when we had also a huge drought. So yes, something went wrong somewhere. And uh, even worse is if we put that in numbers, because graphs might be misleading in some way, uh, you can see Okay, it's research work in University of Leeds. Maybe they are wrong by 10, 20, 50 percent. Doesn't matter. Because we always listen to politicians regarding CO2 emissions. We have to lower emissions by 55 percent. Wow, 10 percent, 20 percent. Our problem is that we are exceeding that limit by 600 percent. It's not about percent, it's about factor. Nitrogen. We are a biotechnical faculty. There's a lot of agronomy people who know that this is a problem, but we still do not have a solution. So we are 500 times beyond the per capita boundary that is sustainable. Only water, as I said, we are doing okay. So this is worrying because we don't need cosmetic changes. They are talking about cosmetics, but we need deep, deep uh, lifestyle changes. So you, you are a landscape architecture, so you have a role and you have some guilt, if I may call it so, in every problem mentioned. So we have general problems, but we have also, especially in built environment, I was focusing on built environment, what actually is uh, the problems you have to think about. So cities, for instance, are outsized contributors to CO2. So, uh, how do we plan cities is obviously uh, a very extremely important question for the future. Also, of what we make cities. So, man-made materials are even making 
uh, climate change problem worse, at least when we talk about, uh, about um, uh, adaptation to climate change. Uh, landscape architecture should also think about biochemical flows. Are sewage discharge in cities and built environment okay or not? Because it's directly contributing to that problem. Uh, also, all the parks, all the lawns, all the gardens, which looks very nice, they don't grow properly if we don't add fertilizers. So where does this fertilizer go? I can tell you, into the drinking water. <laughs> where else? Uh, okay, so uh, fossil fuel combustion it also contributes to the other problem, not just to CO2, also to nitrogen pollution. And also, in cities... City is a big sink for everything, also for food productions and agricultural products, which are connected with fertilization. So these are, on the right side, direct uh, mind uh, uh, or, or <laughs> acute problems that are connected with your planning in the first row. Biodiversity, we all know what urban sprawl is. So fragmentation of uh, ecosystems is a huge problem. So uh, people like these small parks, like small gardens, but you need more than just Adam and Eve that population can survive. You need a lot of Adams and a lot of Eves, so huge park. It's much better solution than the small one. Invasive species, this is something that is obviously happening because some look so nice. And uh, also the pollution, uh, water pollution, which is in the built environment much more common is also uh, killing uh, our species. So yes, it, these are very simple actually, um, simple pro I mean, they're not simple solutions, but obvious problems. Land system, again, uh, it's not just about urban sprawl, it's also how we use uh, wood. Wood is many times important um, material, but uh, we have a lot of unsustainable timber products going around. And of course, all the resources end up in cities, and many of these resources uh, degrade forests as well. So yes, it is again uh, a number of other problems. Water system. In, in urban or, or built environment, we really have concentrated water use, which calls for different uh, approaches and also uh, can uh, cause local uh, ecological strains. Non-porous surfaces. This is uh, something that is very clear. Uh, it's not just about water system degradation. It's also about floods that can happen in the cities more often because of climate change. Well, in Europe, we don't have so much illegal wells, but around the world, it's a lot about illegal water use as well, connected to the built environment. Uh, aerosol loading, again, cities are major energy consumers, and if you burn so much fossil energy, you end up not just with CO2, also with the air pollution. But also construction and all these processes going on in cities sometimes really contribute to air pollution. In many cities they know that, uh, but uh, usually um, investors do not think about uh, so much that uh, construction and demolition is also connected to the air pollution. Okay, uh, chemical pollution is the last uh, transgress boundary. Um, Building materials, all materials you are using, we are using, uh, they, of course, cause pollution at one point or another of supply chain, even at the beginning when you extract uh, ores, for instance. And also uh, cities are con uh, contaminated, especially if they contain industrial sites. Sometimes industrial sites are reconstructed, but... Um, usually, uh, I don't know how much attention is paid that actually this is a polluted soil, polluted land. So yes, it is a lot of things that can go differently. So how to find uh, solutions? I really recommend you this publication. It's online, it's uh, uh, not too big, it's, it's 
excellent publication in terms of what went wrong and what should be done differently. Um, it's new publication and maybe it's concentrated too much on the cities because your landscape architectures, but still many useful information for you as well. Uh, and this book and this research really calls for regenerative actions. So it's, it puts you as a designers, planners, and partly engineers into position that you can address the risks. You can address the risks. Uh, you, you, you can intervene. You can intervene how people will travel in future, how they inhabit space, or how they consume. They consume energy, they consume uh, goods. And the projects that are uh, there already and or they will be assembled should be really rethought, reconsidered, retrofitted. Because uh, it should be very clear that uh, uh, impact on the natural environment should be minimized. So you have the power, you have the knowledge. Uh, it's just a matter of how to do it. For instance, with climate change, uh, there are so many solutions uh, from, I don't know, uh, we all know that cities can produce renewable energy. Uh, it's about energy efficiency. I'm more for that, especially in this time of crisis. Uh, we will be probably left without gas for a while, but we should concentrate on, on consuming less, not so much on switching to other renewable energy because we will not uh, go far. Forest protection. Uh, urban growth limitation because we cannot use so much uh, space. Then uh, sustainable food production or usage in the cities, urban trees, green roofs, school roofs. So there are so many things, but they should be put into perspective, especially those solutions should be favored that are solution to more than just one problem. Because as I mentioned, it's not just climate change. And also in this booklet, you can find these ideas. So what to do, because there are, as I mentioned, problems from biodiversity, climate change, pollution, ozone, and so on. So there are many, many uh, actions that can contribute to a solution to all problems. So I would follow those where you have these circles uh, full circles which have strong effects. So sustainable materials is something that solves more than one problem, for instance. Okay, green roofs. Um, I, I, I saw many roofs this summer which were not green at all, and uh, I was wondering whether this is a really so good solution. Uh, anyway, it's a matter of opinion. So we can see the, what we can do with buildings, what we can do cross-scale, what we can do with the neighborhoods. I think the most important part of the focus, I think it's, in my view, is on neighborhoods. So uh, again, uh, it's quite clear which solutions are uh, focusing on more than one problem. So really, go to see that publication and you will find maybe some new ideas. Uh, I will now start to wrap up. So why bother? Why do all that? It's, isn't it easier to just go the way it used to be? Yes, it would be nice, but it is too costly. We cannot afford to live like we were. You can see that uh, this is study just for Europe, but I think the world numbers are pretty much the same. Even if we manage uh, to stay below two degrees of warming with uh, mitigation, we will still be paying a lot of money. So we can see that in the best case, at least 100 billion euro per year will be the price to pay for not, act not acting in time of Kyoto or not acting before. Uh, it's amazing where is the biggest part of this money, where it will go. It will go to our health problem. There's no study how many people died this summer in the Europe. But believe me, according to 2003, 
when it was 70,000 people just dying in Europe from heat, our, this, this number this year will not be any smaller. So it's health, it's about flooding, it's about also energy needed for cooling. But if we don't act, this money will at least double. So why we cannot afford that probably? I think that, uh, okay, money sometimes it's a relative issue. You can find uh, it somewhere or you can print it like some countries do if you don't have it. But anyway, uh, I really uh, think that this is uh, simply the most important uh, argument also for politicians and for those who are not so big uh, uh, nature lovers, but they are worrying about money. So we cannot afford inaction. But at the same time, I think that we should go deeply. Because when I saw this sentence after COVID, I saw it written everywhere, in one form or another. Recovery from pandemic, or whatever it was called. And then the, the, the second part of the sentence was, must be rooted or must be achieved by Green growth. Sorry, but there is no green growth. On this planet, there is no green growth. Simply doesn't grow. It's actually the growth is the most important cause of the wiping the green from the earth. So promoting economic growth and at the same time talking about fighting climate change is the biggest lie of them all. In my view, you cannot do it both. And usually we know what politicians then follow. So it's high time to start questioning some assumptions. We are engineers. I, as I mentioned, studied physics. But the problem is not there. It's almost uh, in the social soft sciences. Because, for instance, is really competition the only thing that is leading the economic progress? What are we teaching our children when they are small? Are we teaching them competition or to help each other? But then suddenly, when they grow up, they have to be competitive. So kill the others that I will try. More income equals more happiness. Well, if you ask people in India or maybe in Albania, yes, for a while, income more income equals more uh, quality of life. But it stops. Read the same Fitusi report from 2007. More money, yes, to a certain level, but then it's a plateau. Markets are fair and prices tell the truth. Come on, look at the gas stations. This is the truth. This is how people are really uh, making big money. Encouragement of consumption for its own sake. Now we are coming to October and all the shops will have shopping weekend. Come and this fun, shopping is fun, shopping is whatever. Not shopping, but fun or having good time with your family. Focusing on short term, I'm seeing that enough and so on and so on. Also over well with the owners versus other stakeholders. We are all stakeholders when it comes to the nature. There are no owners, but People who decide are almost uh, always uh, consider themselves as owners. And self-interest and ignoring human values is something that we have to start questioning. Even if we are engineers, even if we think this is not my job, yes, it is our job. Who else? Who else will do it? Okay, so how should I conclude? Maybe that is still time to regenerate. And... Uh, if we re do this fundamental shift uh, in the way we think, it's not just how we act, it's how we think. And I think that the next, uh, the next uh, speech will also enlighten that. But yes, there are also the, the, the details, ugly details we have to change the way we produce, consume, and trade. This is something that is hard to achieve, but uh, it is possible. And also how we travel out and within cities also how and what we eat. But it is a, a cause of optimism, as I said, because we can combine. We have to do some changes on large-scale policies. We must influence politicians. But we also 
have to achieve some medium level impact uh, by corporations. So we have to tackle them as well. In daily life, we call, I call that small changes, but they can also chart a new course towards the more hopeful future. So I thank you for your attention. And my last thought is you can't recycle wasted time. So act now. <laughs> Thanks, Luchka, very much, although you were not uh, so uh, unpessimistic as you promised. Uh, we do have time for maybe one or two questions. I think uh, Luchka gave us a lot of food for thought, but maybe some reaction. OK. That, that's fine, but then you, you shouldn't be too long. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Karl Steinitz. I think most of you know him, although he's not European, <laughs> but a, a bit, a bit. You are not anymore. You, you have been for a certain time. <laughs> well, uh, because most of us ha have visited him uh, while he was teaching at GSD at Harvard. Uh, I learned yesterday he had the longest record of teaching there, of all faculty. Uh, and also, he taught at more than 180 universities worldwide. So probably he visited your faculty at some time. And of all these fac uh, universities or faculties, we want to believe that Ljubljana is one of Carl's dearest. It is. It's not just because he has a honorary doctorate, but also because, well, he hosted most of our faculty at some yeah. time. And, well, needless to say, we are so happy to have you here. Good. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Winsa. Floor is yours. And don't be too pessimistic. <laughs> Look, I, I, I've prepared a lecture not knowing what was coming first. But my, my talk fits perfectly into this first presentation, which was outstanding. And the question for us as designers is, what are we going to do about it? Now, I've prepared a lecture that has three parts, and I'm going to change it because of the quality of her lecture, and do the first part, the third part, and then, if I have time, the second part, which is a demonstration, but less important. So if I have to take time out and move some things around, I'll just do it and we won't worry about it. I, I want to skip the first slide and just go to the second slide. The, the, there are, a couple, of, there are a, couple of, a couple of bottom lines to this. The first bottom line is this. Do we really believe that the way we teach basic design and then have our students to focus on gardens and parks and things like that, do you really think that's going to work when we work at the regional and global scale as designers? And the answer is no. It doesn't. And the reason that it doesn't is because we assume that our students have a one human student, one project education. Every student does their own project. And when you go to a larger size and to a different scale, that's impossible. Because we don't either, we, either we don't know enough or we can't see the site. We don't go there. The larger the problem in geography, the less we can do the things we can do on site, live, quickly, and as a single human being. And therefore, the style of teaching that we do, which is focused on one student, one project, has to change to many students, one project. Not only many students, one project, many disciplines, one project. And the question is, what's the role of the landscape architects in that? And it's either going to be a minor, trivial role of short time horizon, or it's going to be a leadership role because you start out with two attitudes that the scientists don't have. One of them, one of them, is that strategy across disciplines 
is more important than detail in one of them if the problem is complicated. And if you have that as part of your education, then you can figure out where the detail is more important and how to accomplish it. But without the strategy as part of your education, and I mean cross-disciplinary strategy, she's right that it's not a landscape problem, it's a problem of this and this and this and this and how it relates. Then the landscape can be figured out. But without that multidisciplinary beginning, you're probably going to make a problem more likely than a solution. That's the reality. And the university systems themselves are not organized that way. They're not organized to produce generalists with a specialty. They're only organized to produce specialists. And the advantage that the designers have over the scientists, once you realize that, is that you can ask them the questions, take advice, and figure out how to do a design. And the advice is not from your own faculty. It's from the other faculties. And that's why the projects that we do have to begin at a scale which sets the problem in a multidisciplinary way for the problem that you can work on in a disciplinary way. And we're missing that in our education. And the question is, what do we do about it? And that's what I want to talk about. And then I'm going to give an example, but if I don't have the time for the example, it's not so important, because it's already on videotape on YouTube. Design occurs at and for different sizes, scales, times, and complexities. Design cannot work well in separated silos, and most of us in our universities are in separated silos. In my school at Harvard, when I started, we had multidisciplinary studios. I was the only person for 40 years who taught multidisciplinary in my school. Every other student stayed in his or her department. It's stupid, but it's true. Different sizes, scales, and times and complexities necessarily interact. The problem is up on top. The answer is down below. They each have different time scales. And they necessarily interact. Over time, design must interact globally to locally to globally, to globally to locally to globally to locally to globally to locally, iteratively. Therefore, we need linked design at more than one size, scale, and time in every project that we do. I used to change the program halfway through my studio. The students were furious, but they knew that it was going to happen. They didn't know when, and they didn't know how. The organization of design must adapt to different sizes, scales, times, and complexities. This is a problem for a designer, a single human being, with assistance. In our schools, the faculty are the assistants, sometimes the classmates. You might have a client. Where's my laser pointer? I'm going to talk more slowly than I'd like to. You may have a client of a family with four children. Each of them has a different view of what the design should be. You meet with them, but not too often. You pick one as a basic idea. You move your design forward. You make presentations for each of them. They are happy, and they build their design. That's all it is. All the rest is embroidery. But that's the basic strategy. The problem gets more complicated. Here you need a design team with consultants, but you still have the same model. You're still going to design a park and a thing there with, along a river, but this time the project is more expensive, so you're going to pay real attention to these people and what they want. You're still going to take one basic idea, probably, foolishly, by the way, and move it forward 
and you're still going to present to them, but this time you have to present sub-designs for each of the pieces. Urbanization, energy, transport, industry, agriculture, whatever it is. In other words, the design is not let's do one set of working drawings, it's make a sub-plan for each of the pieces. Here the problem gets more complicated. What happens here is that you might have a place that has different, different groups of people, and they disagree with each other. They're really at war with each other. And here the problem is this. You've got more things to think about, and each of these groups has a different set of priorities of those things. Transport, food, water, air, jobs, parks, houses. There were people who were rich, there were people who were poor, there were different racial and religious groups. They each have their different views. Here you need a whole large design team. And the problem is that you have to meet with them, and you probably have to meet with them one at a time. And so you start out, I'm sorry, go back. I hate this machine. Excuse me. So you start out with one idea, and you go forward, and you have some meetings, and something goes wrong. Because when you're out here, what you told those people up front has changed. I have a friend who's working on a third of a country, and he's had 200 meetings in the past two years. And the design has changed, and the first person he met with, those ideas that they agreed to are no longer part of the design. So you have to go back to the beginning. And a project of designing a city, or designing the remaking of a city, could be a 10-year design problem in an office. And it doesn't work anymore. Because you have to deal with the minister of this, and the minister of this, and the minister of this, and the minister of this. And they each want their part of the design. And now you're at a crisis. And what you have to end up doing is co-design. What you have to do is co-design, and the design method becomes negotiation. In other words, each of them needs a design, their own design. Their own design, with their own priorities, their own requirements, their own design. And then they have a process of informal negotiation and a process of formal negotiation to come to a design. And that's how governments work. That's how climate is discussed. In other words, you don't agree on the goals you agree at the beginning that they're at war with each other. They each have their design. And what you need to do is figure out a method of designing by negotiation. That's how I taught my studios. My advanced studios for 40 years were 15 students, one design. Why? Because each of them made a preliminary design, and then they had to negotiate. And when you watch them negotiate, they really are learning. And they're learning that the design isn't good just because you made it. And the surprising thing is that at the end of that process, they almost always said the end game design is better than any of us had at the beginning. Why? Because they learned from the additional complexity of other people's views. That's why. In 2015, I proposed that the universities of the world, the design schools, all share the same design language. I did it at a conference. And in 2018, Tom Fisher, who is the dean of the design school at Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and Brian Orland, who many of you know, who was professor at Illinois, Penn State, and Georgia, and I, started the International Geodesign Collaboration to focus on the design of very large landscape systems. We called it geodesign, I called it geodesign, because it isn't the role of landscape architects alone, it's the role of many, many professions. And I didn't want to use the word landscape architecture, not out of disrespect, 
I'm a professor of landscape architecture. But because you needed a word to say this is different. And it's different because of the ways of designing. We now have 240 universities sharing the same design language in 61 countries. There are about 500, 600 people in it. We share that our projects include water, agriculture, green infrastructure, energy, transport, industry, institutions, and housing, and two other things that we don't define because you have different circumstances. We've all agreed to work at at least two or three scales on any project. The scale that's bigger to set the context, or smaller to set the context, and the scale that we're really focused on. We decided to work on history, 2020, 2020, 35, and 2050 as dates. And we decided to work on three scenarios, early adoption dealing with climate change, adoption of mitigation and adaptation, non-adoption of mitigation and adaptation strategies, and doing it late. What's the price of doing it late, starting in 2035, when the problems really hit you? And we decided to judge, not model, but judge the impact on the UN Sustainability Development Goals on all of our projects. We have published the first 50 projects. They're all in the same language. You could read each other's maps easily, and they're all comparable by the Sustainable Development Goals. Why should a student decide what color to use for a slope map? as opposed to tell them what color they have to use for a slope map. And there are all kinds. There are coastal zone flooding, there are opening rivers, there are planting forests, there are growing... We, we have about a dozen in every category, globally distinguished. And when we analyzed the designs, the first 50, this is all on the internet, when we analyzed them, we found something that was very, very important for us. And that is, looking at a continental level, let alone an economic level of development level, we found that the priorities selected by our academic colleagues, faculties of landscape architecture, and some geographers and some engineers, half of these, two-thirds of these projects are run by landscape architects, because we did this by word of mouth that they were different. In other words, the conclusion we draw that a single set of global policies and projects will not be workable as a concept, that regional and local variation will dominate decision-making for geographic reasons and economic and political reasons. And so saying there's one policy globally is not going to happen effectively. So the problem that you have as a designer is where are you and what's the set of things that you can do in your geography to deal with a global problem? And those answers will not be the same, they'll be different. The Europeans in general will not solve the same problems, they'll have the same problems, but they won't solve them the same problem as the African contingent, or especially the Central African contingent. And that's good, in a sense, because it's interesting. We're not, we, don't, we can't copy each other, basically. But what if it's the whole world? What if our aim is to design the whole world? And I think that is our aim. I think the globe is the real design problem, not the park. The park will follow what the globe does. The park won't lead the globe. Then it's going to be co-designed with the design team among many jurisdictions with negotiation as the design method. And now I've got a case which I'll skip. Three months ago, four months ago, 
uh, Brian Orland, I, and Peter Drogi from Liechtenstein, professor in Liechtenstein University. He has the Institute for Sustainable Development at that university. We're asked to figure out a way to make a global design, which we thought, I, I, I gave a lecture at this university that's published in Slovene about making a global design in two, 2003. It's a design that has to be local and global at the same time. Go forward, come on, move. This is the temperature of the world. That's where we are now, that's predicted if it goes up by 20 to 20 to the year 2100 that's 80 years from now but look at these look at this look 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 temperature stabilized in a range at current median average temperatures only over the past 10,000 years and peaked at the 1960 90 average for around 2 million years now they head back up to where they were five to 10 million years ago, long before the age of humans. In other words, three gen four generations from now, the temperature will be pre-human. I'm doing, over the most recent million year period, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane peaked at around 280 parts per million and 600 parts per billion respectively. Now they're at 420 and 1900, rising exponentially. So this is uh, the thing about my talk in contrast to the first one. She knows more than I do, but I make maps. That's very important because the question is where are you and what are you where you are causing the problems and potentially solving them maybe so these are the maps of the sources, that left-hand one. This is a map of the, the globe, and if it's ye yellow or pink, it has changed since 1960. I started teaching at MIT as a graduate student in 1960. In my academic life, this is the map of the world and the land that has changed from 1959. I'm gonna show you five maps that are really important. The upper left is where water is scarce now, and if it's brown, it's scarce 12 months of the year. On the upper right, if the climate temperature increases three degrees Celsius, it's a map of the change in crop yield by temperature. Dark red is 50% loss. In the same area, same process. Dark green is it could get much better. Population is still growing, and it's still growing in areas that export people. Because there's a correlation between growth rate and problems. Children are insurance. Most of them die. And this is one that is really interesting. This is and all for the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. This is an index of human habitat suitability. In other words, do you have water? Can you get food easily? If it's red, it means you're a candidate to migrate. If it's green and it's underpopulated, you're gonna be a receiver of migration. And at an 11 billion population in the world, the red area houses now a billion and a half people. 
So if you think Europe has a migration problem, you haven't seen anything yet. A billion and a half people by 1970 at current practices will be candidates for migration. A billion and a half. And this came yesterday in the newspaper. This is Armstrong and others from the University of Exus, Exeter. This is a scale of temperature and major landscapes. Northern, northern forest dieback at four degrees Celsius on average. That's their prediction. And these are landscapes. These are the most important landscapes in the world. And their life, this is a model of their expected lifespans. And, and, and as you heard before, it doesn't matter if it's 20% wrong. The fact of the matter is it's dying. Dying. Now, the, pro the problem that we're going to attack as a collaborative, and I'm going to invite you all to participate, the problem is not how to maintain a 1.5 degree Celsius limit as, a, as per the Paris Agreement, but at a zero degree increase over pre-industrial levels. In other words, I think that the IPCC is too timid in its public policy presentations. It's not a problem. It is a problem of emissions. But the real problem is how do you get the carbon out of the greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? How do you remake the surface of the earth, the landscape and cities, so they get the carbon out before they kill us? And if you wait to 2050, which is what the US government and the Europeans are saying, what happens between now and 250 to make the situation worse than we're having even now? Don't forget that three weeks ago, 20, 30 million Pakistanis had to move. 30 million had to move. The floods in Germany are nothing compared to that. This can't, net zero can't possibly deliver a stable climate because today's atmospheric CO2 concentrations already exceed the level of a long-term long -term stable value, which we had pre-industrial revolution, and certainly pre-1970s. And 250, 2050 is too far ahead. So what we're producing is we're going to accept a bad scenario, and we're going to really try to say, what does it mean for the landscape of the world if we move the landscape of the world and its cities to, be f to a climate situation before the pre-industrial revolution. That's a much more radical position. And we're doing it, it may be a Don Quixote type uh, experiment, but I think that's the problem you should give your students. And you should give it to your students because in their lifetimes, by the time they're leaders, that's the problem that they'll have. It's not today's client and today's site. It's tomorrow's unknown client and tomorrow's site that they ought to be doing schoolwork on. And so our aim is not the IPC scenarios. It isn't. It's a much more radical one. It's what can you do by 2030, what can you do by 2030 so that by 2050 and afterwards you've lowered carbon, methane, in the atmosphere. Part of that is changing current practices, a very important part. But it's not enough. It's even worse. Well, to do that, we need some tools, which is what I and Peter and Brian and, and 10 other people spent last week designing in California. I'm now going to show you stuff that is live. It was done last week. We're building a tool that links Esri's... Esri makes half the world's maps. It's owned by a former student of mine. 
Geodesign Hub is a tool based by another former student of mine. And it's a synthesis tool for dealing with big maps. We're going to try to link it to national laboratory climate science models in the United States. And last week we met in California. That's Peter Droge in the that's us in the lower upper right. Peter Droge from Liechtenstein in the upper left, upper right rather, upper right. Yeah, Jack Dangerman and me designing a set of software tools. And the lower right is what we're going to make. And we're going to make it within the next three months. It's going to link a set of tools that work. And I can show you an example if I have time. The database, the database is a global data set at what? at 10 meters, 10 meters square. 10 meters square global database. There are 60 people at Esri working on analyzing that data. There are four of those units in this room, rough. Maybe, maybe that's, how, that's maybe 15 meters, I guess. This room, is, let's call this a global map at the scale of this room. It's already on the internet. You could look it up and you can actually download maps. We're gonna be working not on nations and countries, but on ecological zones as the basis of design. This is Europe in 2022, and Europe projected in one of the IPCC scenarios if you do nothing different in 2050. Now it gets more interesting. This is Slovenia. Let's... let's Let's look more closely. Let's look more closely. What you see here, if you're in, look there. That's one square kilometer. That's one square kilometer. We're working, we're working on diagrams for designing strategies at one square kilometer. Why? Because at 10 square kilometers, a climate model of 10 square kilometers, change at the scale of this room can estimate globally the effect of climate change. I'll repeat that. A design at the scale of this room at the level of modeling, spatial, temporal climate modeling can tell you the effect of the climate not to the decimal points times three, but is it getting hotter or is it getting cooler? And the data are available to go from one kilometer to 10 meters for detailed design. Detailed as I see it, not detailed as whether this plant goes here or here. <laughs> so you have an interesting problem. This is a typical design problem for a larger area at the University of Ljubljana. These are friends of mine. I know these faculty. So Moitz's studio, she has a very interesting problem. Does she give her studio that map of 2022 as the study area, or does she give her studio that map at 2050 as the study area, or does she say to her students, Let's start now and halfway through the semester say, oh, all of a sudden, it's 2050. Now change your design. Or did your design survive 2050? That would scare the hell out of them. But they'd learn a hell of a lot. And anybody in this room and in the world who's teaching studios can download that data for themselves, now. I can't tell you the legend. No, no, just look, because I just did this yes, two days ago with, with, with them. The legend is this. 
just a minute. The, the, the legend is, the legend is this. We're going to work on 420 ecological types, divide, div, div, somewhat similar to the work of Christian and Stewart in Australia in 1950. It's not a new idea. It's not biotopes, but it's a combination of temperature and moisture and a whole bunch of other things that creates an index and say so these are ecological zones. We're not working on country boundaries. We're simply going to design into what we're doing is, we'll, I'll show you, a, a big matrix of climate change ideas, as you were presented by in the first lecture, which ones are appropriate and most likely to be affected in which kinds of ecological zones, and say, which ecological zones, by God given, are you inheriting? And then it's your problem to figure out what the changes are for your design. And those will be different in each type of geography. And, and there are good ideas from the IPCC, but they're mainly on emissions and not on carbon sequestering as much. Come on, move forward. Move forward. So we're building a large matrix, very similar to this, of ideas which can change climate and 420 oceanographic, oceanographic types and land types, ecological types. And different ones go in different places. But they go in different places at a one kilometer square or smaller. Because the data are one kilometer. We're going to evaluate every of the activities in five levels. Where you should protect something in two levels and where you should change something in two levels. And there's a team of people that's going to do that. And this is, this is, what, this is my notes from the, from the meeting last week. It was last Friday. So what we're going to do is the following. We're going to build a matrix of climate mitigation and adaptation techniques. And we're going to say which ecological zones globally are going to be the best ones to place these things in. We're going to make a global bad design. And we're going to make a global good design. And that global good design will say, if you have these ecological zones in your study area, these are some things that you should think about. Very similar to the first lecture. Which is saying, if you're in a European city, these are the things you should be thinking about. But if you're in Central Africa in the desert, those aren't the things you should be talking about. And there's a group of people that's going to do that. Some of you are going to be in that group, I suspect. Then we're going to feed those as guidance to any local team in, in the world, any local university team in the world. And it doesn't have to be landscape architects. It should be a mixed team. But we've got some that are run by geographers, some by engineers, but most are being run by landscape architects. And you're the one who has to define what your study area is. And you download that, and you download the policies that your students should be thinking about. And then it's your problem. But then what's interesting is you take your site and you make a 2050 design, and then you say, what can we do between now and 2030 immediately? And then you have two designs, an immediate design and what you want, an immediate one by 2030 and one by 2050. And you could feed those into a climate science model. But what we're really thinking of doing is then aggregating things that we learn from local designs, the spatial distribution of these things, which will be different in every type of geography. We already know that from our previous work. And what we're going to do is generalize from the local variance to a potentially feasible good 2030 design and 2050 design. And that's in the exact same language as a global map projection, which does now go into a climate science model. In other words, the climate science models that are making these predictions are basically reading satellite data from the Earth 
and interpreting it for temperature. And all we're doing is not using current data, we're inventing a new landscape in the same language, feeding it into the same model and saying, what's the difference? And it may be insufficient to change the things we really want to change. It may not work. But if you don't try, you'll never know. And so we have, for comparison, 2000, and that should be, it's my mistake, it should be 2022, a bad design, a good design for 2050, and a good design for 2030. And that design can create a temperature gradient. And by the way, I need to show something. Below here, I'm not sure you can read it, but I absolutely agree that it's not a problem of climate and landscape. We're going to deal with conservation, urbanization, food and fiber, fresh water and energy, each of which has its own model. But what we don't know is whether climate drives those or those drive climate. Right? We just don't know how that works. Nobody knows exactly how that works. So we're dealing with it independently. And we're saying that climate is going to drive those or limit them. And there are really important questions. What's the difference between the bad case and the good case? And where is the difference between the bad case and the good case? Can the climate hockey stick model be reversed in the good case? Can it actually be thought about to be able to work? Or are we really, really stuck in a very bad position? In which case, you're right. You have to change everything. Can the climate hockey stick model be reversed by concerted local action to 2050? I think the answer is no. You need global action from the top down and local action from the bottom up. How effective can climate change be mitigated by concerted local action by 2030 so that the current things don't happen till 2050 and really kill people? Much more. And we're doing visualization technologies so that every single project that's local becomes the center of the world, which is easy. We already know how to do that. It's now September 22. We're going to make, we think, our first tests locally, which will be Southern California, which radically changes in the next 30 to 40 years, because they run out of water. And we're going to make the first global design in April 2023, if not beforehand. In June 2023, we will have a package which can be taken free with all the software by any university in the world. We're, finance, we're financed at a level and have organized it in such a way that everything that we do will be free to university teams that join this collaboration and take on this kind of a problem. And we're going to run tutorials for faculty in the summer of 2023. I've already been doing this for years on the internet. In August 2023, any studio that wants to take on this problem will have its materials in its own house free. We expect the results to be in the same language so that they all local projects can be combined on one map as guidance, adding a mapping capability to the IPCC, which reports things in graphs and words. And we expect to publish a global report in June 2024. We have two objectives. We have two serious objectives, which is why this is a well-supported activity. One is to add design to international climate negotiations and design that is not on national boundaries, but on the ecological units that make up the landscape of the world. 
And the second is to be blunt, to change education from being professionally limited to being multidisciplinary and much more serious. The universities are the hindrance by their bureaucratic means. But it doesn't mean that we can't do things under the table that are for the benefit of our students. And we invite every university in any discipline, but especially landscape architects, because they tend to be the best ones prepared for this kind of stuff, to join us. And if you're interested, go to the website and join today. It costs nothing except your time and the time and energy of your students. I'm prepared to stop. Thank you, Carl. I look forward to the first um, the global landscape map. <laughs> and uh, we'll be there, of course. Uh, as you said uh, before, we can take a few questions yeah. for both our speakers, because I think that both lectures were really uh, well harmonized. We didn't do it in advance. No, <laughs> no not at all, no. <laughs> so this, she gave it concise, to the point, and powerful. We have a microphone. We have two questions. Hello, uh, I'm Lili Lichka from Vienna. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I wonder where human science comes in. Where human? Human or social sciences come in. I, in my case, I have no idea. Uh, look, you, where does it come in now? We have, we have our colleagues and our students designing places for human beings to the knowledge that they have. But it's not a formalized knowledge which is tested by either theory or models in the social sciences. To the extent, to the extent that we could add that, sure. But not in the first year when we're only getting our legs on the ground. So in my case, if I, had, if I had models that could read land use plans that talk about demographics, populations, religions, economics, whatever, I'd be delighted, absolutely delighted. At this point, I would say, get me the best social sciences that I can, have them look at our work and say something based on their experience. But the problem is that we're speaking different languages. And yes, social science is critical. But we're coming at this from physical sciences, and we need to get our own act together before we integrate. And, and it's hard enough to think about more than, it's hard enough to think about six systems, let alone one of many that have to be integrated. Her presentation was right. She's got a bunch of things that she says are more important. They're categorized. They're not independent. They interact, but we're not sure how. And, and we have a huge ignorance. But we have a synthetic mind, and we don't have that in shape now, as far as I'm concerned. So if we can get that in shape and just, have, just prove that we can make a big design, which I could show you a big one for the whole Amazon. But without, without changing what we're doing now and broadening it, I'm not asking people to dismiss what they're doing. I'm asking them to add to what they're doing which is not easy in a university. And social sciences are on that list, but they're not there now. Well, I, I, uh, I'm talking more like, uh, in general, when you make changes, uh, it's not just uh, that you, you're changing environment, people are also changing uh, as a species, and I, I just, uh, I have quite the opposite. <laughs> actually, opinion. Mm. It's uh, social science is extremely crucial because any global design needs global governance. Mm. It, otherwise, it will be just a map on paper. 
So how to achieve the global governance regarding environmental problems? This is something that is totally missing in UN system. Yeah. Because as long as we will have country sovereignty, so I can do on my territory whatever I want, so long we will never be able to, to, to solve any global environmental problem. And uh, yeah. we are quite far from that. So I would include, in a way, uh, social sciences from the beginning because what is good and what is bad is already a social human category. Exactly. Because, you know, if you talk with some biologists, they, they say changes are, in, in, uh, are, are, are ne necessary. So some people, invasive species, they don't see it as invasive. It's the way the life proceeds. So People have moved, plants are moving. So what is good, what is bad, what is... Uh, uh, all these definitions, in a way, they need social sciences badly. And we are not uh, educated enough we cook from the natural sciences and vice versa. Many social sciences feel they can contribute, but they, they don't see themselves, I don't know, suitable to, to judge about uh, physics, for instance. So we have to change this, the... Uh, I fully agree with you that uh, uh, university systems, in a way, that we really are universities, not just faculties. Exactly. Thank you. Udo Weiler. Uh, yeah, Udo Weiler from the Technical University of Munich. Thanks for these uh, two inspiring lectures for the conference. Very, very fascinating. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I have to admit I'm a bit helpless as a professor. As a student who started in 1986, I was doing my practical training as ESRI. I've seen men and biosphere projects. I heard in 1986 lectures by Professor Wolfgang Haber on ecology and all of that stuff. And I have a very bad conscience, to be honest, that we didn't succeed in all these years, in decades, in spite of the knowledge we had 30 years and 40 years ago, in spite of the technology we already had, right. that we didn't succeed to make a difference. And my major question is, what did we do wrong? Why didn't we? We had the knowledge 30 years ago. We had the, the software 30 years ago. What did we do wrong uh, down the way that we got into this situation right now? You know, that I'm standing in front of my students having a, really a bad conscience, saying, you know, I was born in 1963. I had all the knowledge on my table. Why didn't we succeed in turning uh, this place into a better place? Well, who's we? <laughs> well, look, I don't take responsibility for that. Neither, neither should you. I think that what you have is a body politic and a nationalistic system of government that has made it impossible. I think that this, the science has been there since the 1950s. And the technologies have been there, adequate technologies, since the 1960s. The first, the first, digital, the first large digitally supported studio in Europe was done in this university by Ivan Maruzic. Here in 1970, and nothing came from that. But it wasn't Ivan Maruzic's fault. I think that it's the body politics fault. Now, it seems to me that the things, the things that are happening now is that the crisis is so large that our students are ahead of the faculty, in some schools at least, in terms of what they understand and what they think is important and certainly ahead of the university structures. And I think that the, I think your conscience should, should be clear. It's not your fault that the thing has not happened. It's their fault. Well, it's true. It's true. It's not, it's not your fault that IPCC, that IPCC reports aren't followed and their recommendations. Because you're right and they're wrong. But we're all suffering from it. The problem is that our students are really going to suffer from it unless they're in a position to lead it. And that'll take five years of education and 10 years of 
intellectual and political growth. But the responsibility, I, I think the responsibility is on our side if we don't teach them about what they're going to be facing. If you, really think, if you really think it's a good thing to have a private client building a garden for his house, without thinking about the climate issues and without thinking about the consequences, I think you're causing a problem. Then you should feel guilty. And you deserve to feel guilty. But if you're teaching them that things have to change radically, you should be happy. Unless it, life goes on for another 20 years for you and your students and things go crazy. It won't for me, because I'm old. Right? But it seems to me that that's the real issue of, of the ethics of what we're teaching. If we're teaching for today's first jobs, as opposed to today's third jobs, we're making a huge mistake on behalf of our students. And that's the tradition of our professional education. All right? We're training more than we're educating. Uh, well, the, the exactly the same question as I was asking myself many times. And, uh, and I think I know what many of, I'm not talking about every university in the world, but let me talk about Central European universities. We did not step out of our comfort zone. We did not step out. Because when you step out, you get these bangs. I did it for a while. Uh, you have to be good with media. Did we take the media? We are professors. We know how to talk. But it's an ugly job. So it's out of the comfort zone. And we also, uh, also, we are teachers, we are scientists, and they are politicians. Did we make them think differently? Again, stepping out of the comfort zone. And same goes for the students. I, I remember the only protest in the last 30 years in Ljubljana, when really students went out on the street, was when they tried to, to change the financing of their... Um, uh, the, 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 uh, they, they had some money for the food, and they, this, this money went down, and then went, and then they throw, uh, I don't know, granite to the parliament. But they don't protest because of environment. They don't protest because they may have no future. Why? Do we encourage them? I'm, I'm not trying to be revolutionary, but it's again, they have to step out of the comfort zone. Yes, we are guilty, yeah. Not, not that I could not sleep at night, but uh, uh, we could do more. Who else will? That's Tell okay. me. Okay, thank you, Carl. I have to uh, speed up a bit. Uh, and I have, no, no, just you can stay here because uh, we shouldn't forget our colleagues uh, online. And we will take one more question from uh, online chat. Uh, today is, you can follow it. Yeah, okay. So I will read the question from, we got from our online participants in the chat. Um, Bala Ibrahim is asking for more explanation about, about a global design as the world has different climate and ecology. Well, the base map, the base map at a global scale recognizes climate and ecological zones as the fundamental elements. And if you then define a study for yourself that is relevant to your own geography and your own interests, and in my opinion, it should be as large as possible, then those climatological variations to the extent that they exist and the set of ecological zones as they exist or as they are forecast to be in a do-nothing different scenario, are available on the web to be downloaded on your computer whenever you like, for no cost. I think we have to stop at this point because uh, we will be late for sessions and we'll have a shorter coffee break, but there will be some time for discussion tomorrow at roundtable.
which is also being plenary. Yeah, um.